I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Ronnie Zaiden, who will be mo moderating today's showcase. Ronnie is joining us from the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at the University of Pennsylvania and is the immediate past chair of the AAMC's Organization of Student Representatives. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for the introduction, Marcy. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of our panelists as well as all of our attendees to uh, today's webinar. It is sure to be exciting and transformative, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have our panelists with us today to, to share some of the fantastic work that they've been doing over the past 12 months. Before I begin, I'd just like to give you a background on what the OSR is. So the OSR, which is the Organization of Student Representatives, consists of representatives from 140 uh, U.S. LCME accredited, accredited medical schools were tasked with uh, two major responsibilities. One, communicating local issues, concerns, as well as projects to the national level. And on the second hand, they also take back national initiatives started at the AAMC as well as the OSR back to their home institution. At the beginning of last year, uh, as an ad board, we, we sat down and kind of discussed different ways that we could bring OSR reps together throughout the nation and kind of rally behind a common cause. The AAMC has been extremely supportive of our endeavors of, of contributing to their joint initiative with the, with the White House in the Joining Forces campaign. And just, just a brief background on the Joining Forces campaign. Uh, this is a campaign that, as I mentioned, was started by the White House in partner with the AAMC, and the aim is to continue to raise awareness in academic medical centers across the nation about the specific needs of the health and wellness of our veteran service members and their families. We felt that the, this part of our education was extremely vital and extremely timely. At the beginning of last year, the OSR challenged our OSR reps across the nation to contribute to this endeavor in various ways. We recognized that each community had specific needs that needed to be met, so we asked the OSR reps to identify those needs at their own home institutions and to implement special projects and programs to enrich education, research, and clinical missions related to the military personnel, veterans, and their families. So they began around this time 12 months ago, and we had a tremendous response. We had over 25 very transformative projects that were implemented at their home institutions, and we were fortunate enough to have our specific guests with us today who will share, share with us exactly what projects they, they were able to implement. I'd like to welcome our following panelists, from George Washington University, Amy Waldner and Dr. Crichton, Eric Jung from Penn State, Thomas Fowler and Josiah Hill from USF, and Gil Weintraub and Chris Roberts from UCLA David Giffen School of Medicine. At this time, I'll turn the microphone over to Amy Waldner. Thanks, Ronnie, for the introduction, and thanks so much for having me. Thanks also to the WMC for bringing the Joining Forces Initiative to the national front. It's a thrill and an honor to be a part of something so timely and necessary. I want to preface my comments by thanking Dr. Catherine Cretien as well. All of the credit for this project goes to her. She started the narrative medicine course at the VA, and in addition to being a leader in this field, she's a fantastic mentor and teacher. For a brief overview of the narrative medicine course, most third-year GW medical students rotate at the VA hospital as part of their medicine clerkship. During the four-week clerkship at the VA, students participate in the narrative medicine course. The first session during the first week is an introduction to narrative medicine and an attentive listening exercise with a partner. Students then have approximately two weeks to identify patients who may really need their voice to be heard. As students get to know their patients, they set aside time, 20 to 30 minutes or more, to spend time with their patients simply talking about their patient's background, illness, and how it has shaped their life. Students write a brief narrative reflection and read it back to the patient. The final session during the fourth week is a group reflection session. There are multiple goals of the course, but the goals I would like to emphasize are listed on the slide. 
The course allows students to develop narrative competence, attentive listening skills, and to really help students understand the unique healthcare needs of veterans from their veteran story. The lessons learned from this course are endless and couldn't fit all on this slide, but to highlight a few. What really moved me was the ability to better understand my patients, their decision-making process, and especially for patients nearing the end of their life, their end-of-life wishes. As I started better understanding my patients' stories, it helped me better understand their health care needs, connect with them, and in turn, improve their treatment plans. It helped me think about their illness from their perspective. This is when it really struck me how essential reflection in medicine is. Reflecting helps me see my patients as individuals separate from their, from their illness. Further, reflection helps me work through my own emotions with regards to my patients. What I would really like to point out here that relates to the Joining Forces Initiative is that narrative medicine offers a different approach to healthcare needs for veterans, especially mental health. The exercise itself is therapeutic in nature. And in turn, it helps students understand additional health care needs of veterans both at the VA and outside of the VA. Thus, the program extends beyond the VA and into the community. Regarding tips for implementing this course at your institution, first, provide evidence. Students often get overwhelmed in the scientific knowledge component of medicine and should be reminded about the benefits of being an empathetic physician, especially how compassionate care leads to better outcomes. Second, sharing experiences in a group setting provides a different component. Students recognize how to develop emotional cognition together. And if students reflect together now, they will likely incorporate this to their practice in the future. And third, this offers a unique role for medical students. As a student, I sometimes find myself not knowing exactly how to be helpful. Participating in narrative reflection with my patients gives me responsibility and autonomy with my patients. In trying to advocate and expand narrative medicine as a beneficial and hopefully someday core component of practice, we featured the course during our Joining Forces Wellness Week in November. Each day we shared narratives written by fourth year medical students with the whole student body. Finally, I wanted to share a personal anecdote with everyone, which is my first narrative. The most memorable is the first patient I had the opportunity to write a narrative about. He was very special to me because he was my first patient who passed away during my training. Unfortunately, he passed away the day after I spent time with him reflecting and writing a narrative. I'm honored to know that the last day of his life was spent reflecting about his highs and lows and that he shared it with me. And to wrap it up, I will read the narrative I wrote with him. Mr. X is the perfect patient. I should preface this with saying I'm going to keep his name anonymous and call him Mr. X. Mr. X is the perfect patient. He is obedient to a fault, committed to the traditional role that the doctor is always right. He is quick to follow orders and last to complain. I met Mr. X for what we thought would be an overnight observation for a blood transfusion. What unfolded was a series of difficult diagnoses, prognoses, and decisions. But throughout this time, Mr. X remained passively persistent, similar to how he shepherded his life. As a child, he worked diligently to provide extra money to his single mother raising four kids. As an adult entrepreneur, he dedicated his life and work to serve others through drywalling. His goal was to provide a nice life for his family. He built a community around his work until asbestos poisoning forced him to retire. Throughout Mr. X's life, he had been plagued by a series of illnesses. One would never know. Even in his times of suffering, he selflessly offers help, teeming with a gentle innocence ingenuity upon every offering. After his blood transfusion, a biopsy showed that his colon cancer had returned, this time spreading throughout his abdomen. Set to start palliative chemotherapy, his course was halted due to a bowel obstruction, likely caused by the cancer. Left with few options and a partially functioning single kidney, he spent the past few days over discussing medical dogma with Mr. X. With every new medical stressor we threw at him, he maintained a thoughtful and patient and patient and, and remained patient in stillness. Never quick to judge or blame for his illness or for the lack of patient-centered simplistic discussion. The last few days of his life were peppered with uncovering his true joys. Camp, gambling, Las Vegas, IHOP, eating, love, and prayer. But to witness this man pour over pride for his kids is one of my true joys. As a father of six, his kids and grandkids are his true happiness. If they feel even one eighth of the love he has for them, they will never feel lonely. He was the rock of his family, always focused on carrying on his family. 
the last conversation I had with Mr. X. He left me with simple yet profound advice per usual. He said, it's a Friday night, time to put on your dancing shoes. So in celebration of his life, we will dance. Thanks again for letting me participate, and thank you to Dr. Kretien, um for instituting this course as a part of our medical school curriculum. So hello, Christine. I'd like to start off with uh, a thanks to the AAMC for the opportunity to share what we've done here at Penn State, and very happy to present on behalf of the Penn State Joining Forces team. And I want to start off with a brief background on the individuals involved. Uh, Dr. Paul Giuliano is the Department of Orthopedics, and he's a former Navy Captain with the Medical Corps. Uh, Dr. Singh is the Associate Dean for Diversity at our school and also a an interventional radiology. He is not a military physician, but that's part of the learning lessons that we took away from planning this event, just having a diverse array of individuals involved. R Rose Barron is from the Office of Diversity and myself. So having a military and non-military physician, a staff member, and a student come together to help plan the event was a big success here at Penn State. And the link to the Office of Diversity was critical for us. And not every school might have an Office of Diversity, but if there is an Office of Diversity, I would certainly recommend that a collaboration of this nature be explored. And at Penn State, the Joining Forces Initiative took the form of a series of events and activities, and we want to highlight the grand rounds. And we focused on the Veterans Day in particular. And the speaker that we had was Brigadier General John Gronsky, and we wanted to identify a speaker with ties to the university. And this tie came through Dr. Giuliano, our military physician. Now, leading up to the event, we reached beyond the medical school through all four classes, residents, and departments to not only include the medical center, but also nursing, public health, and graduate students. And part of the incentives that we provided for attending was that we offered CME for this talk as well. And to give a overview of the attendance, we had 56 people signed in for the talk. And anecdotally, there were more, but those were the people who signed in to, to get the food. And food is obviously a very good motivator for attending the talks. We also had nine folks sign in for the CME credits. So here's a picture of General Gronsky in action. He has that stern look on his face, but he's actually a very admirable and approachable um, man. He's an excellent speaker as well. He, he gave a prepared talk without slides, but shared a lot of stories. And it was very memorable. He drew comparisons between the military and medical professions. And he's really centered on the duties and responsibilities and shared attributes such as character resilience and sense of duty and how both professions abide by a code of ethics. And he, he taught us a few lessons, including that Veterans Day is a day of peace rather than an anniversary of battles fought, pointed out that of the 8 million veterans in the U.S., uh, 1 million reside in Pennsylvania. And this year picture is proof that General Gronsky does smile as he's, General Gronsky is on the left, Dr. Giuliano is right next to him, and Dr. Singh is in the white coat. One of the points that I'd like to mention is that if there is media capability, uh, it would be highly recommended to record the talk as um, it was, a, first of all, a very good talk and uh, provides an opportunity to review the talk at a later time. And this picture shows military students from the military medicine interest group who also were involved. So not only do we have non-military students involved, but also military students, and that really helped with the planning process. So leading up to the event, we had both passive uh, marketing in terms of uniforms and information in the display case, signs put up on the walls, but also active marketing in the form of email and word of mouth. And on that note, I'd like to extend a thank you to Ali Anderson and Anita Navarro for the support. Kind of touching on the best practices, really, for planning an event such as this, uh, I was invited to primarily speak about the Grand Rounds, but we also did have a fantastic technical talk on TRICARE following the Diversity Grand Rounds, and that was given by Brian Hurley of War Ward Circle Strategies. But focusing on the Grand Rounds, the, the teamwork between the military and non-military physician students and staff members was, was key. Having that partnership with the Office of Diversity was very helpful and it actually helped us identify the speakers that we brought to Penn State. 
As far as lessons learned going forward, we did have a team of the individuals that I mentioned, but it would help going forward to have a planning committee, given that the event um, required quite a bit of time and energy to plan, and having a regular set of committee meetings leading up to the execution of the event would be helpful. I also noted that documenting the planning process through a shared digital resource, which we did using a Google Docs um, option, was very helpful to keep an ongoing checklist of the different pieces in play, but having that in place from the start would be very helpful to keep track of what needs to be done. And finally, reaching out to the community um, for community involvement is something that would be another option for us to explore. Now, I just want to finish up with acknowledgments. I spoke about a team of four individuals, but it really took a lot more um, help to pull this off. And internally, for us, that meant having the help of our other primary OSR representative is a medical student as well, Kyle Lewis. And he, what he did was he wanted to help the main campus get involved. Our medical school is detached from the Penn State main campus. Uh, from we also had other offices involved, such as the Student Affairs Office with D Dwight Davis, Amy Bacchus, and Christy Patrick, who were very helpful. Uh, as far as service activities that we used to supplement the speaking events, uh, we actually had a blood drive going on at the same time, and Lynn Doherty was helpful in that regard, as well as Jerry Davis and Becky Colban. And finally, we had help from Marketing Communications, um, Joel Lofman and Misha Kreider from Events Planning. Now, I understand that the names mentioned are more meaningful locally, but the point that I was trying to make is that perhaps at the respective schools, similar individuals can be sought for their help. And externally, we also had help as well. We reached out to the VA's Office of Academic Affiliations. Uh, Dr. Barbara Chang was very helpful, as well as, as, well as Laura Stefanowitz. And what we were able to um, gain from that was we were able to receive about 500 military health history pocket cards to give to students and attendees, and that was very helpful. And finally, we reached out to Dr. Charles Goldberg, from, who was a UCSD physician and professor and at the San Diego VA Hospital. And just being able to reach both interni internally and externally for guidance was very helpful. So thank you so much to the WMC for inviting us to present. And I'll pass the mic along to Josiah Hill. And we'd like to thank. You. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josiah Hill, and I'm former lieutenant in the United States Coast Guard. Alongside with me is Tom Fowler, who is the OSR representative for AMC at University of South Florida Morsani College of Medicine here in Tampa. We'd like to present our Veterans Health, Veterans Success Health Network that we uh, began here at USF. Um, this program, to give a little bit of a background, there are 2.2 million Iraq and Afghanistan veterans that are returning from combat or that have served during this war. However, um, very few of those are expected to return to their former active duty or their um, or former units. Instead, they're expected to uh, get out of the military after their first two years. As a result, the healthcare possibilities are expected to triple by 2020, and the VA has continued to spend more and more money each year to ensure that the education and the health benefits for these veterans are unmet. To give a background on USF uh, alone, and I don't know why this is showing up in different colors, so I apologize for that. Um, but here in, the, here in the Tampa Bay region, we have a pretty sub pretty substantial amount of support, both from the faculty and from the administration, from different uh, resources here. We have the VA Medical Center, which is directly across the street from us. There's actually a bridge connecting the medical school and the medical center. And then there's also the Tampa Bay uh, Buccaneers, which have a, a massive uh, support network for, for veterans. And then the Office of Veterans Services for the undergrad campus of our main side has a pretty wide array of, of different things that they do for, for veterans here. On campus, we have about 1,700 military veterans, and at the health department alone on the health side, we have about 60 between all the different, uh, all the different health professional schools. <clears throat> so our mission that we'd like to try to determine is well, why do we want to bring people to US Health? Why do we want to create a success network for veterans to give them somewhere to go once they get out of the military, should they decide to continue their service in the health professions, and what can we do to help them? So 
coming up with some reasons why, particularly the USS, some of the things that we believe strongly here, again, the Office of Veteran Services um, is a collaboration between the VA Educational Benefits and also the VA Health Network, which are two individual entities um, that are both on campus, so veterans are able to have a one-stop shop and just walk in directly there, get their educational benefits, and um, begin their report for the health, uh, health procedures. <clears throat> the Department of Admissions here at USF Health in particular, both undergrad and at the Morsani College of Medicine, really understands and values the, the sacrifice that many veterans have made and, and the leadership and some of the life lessons that, that veterans have here. So we just, again, just like to thank all the administration and faculty and, and staff here at USF for, for appreciating that and, and looking to see what they can do to help. For, the, um, for our mission in general, ultimately it is threefold. Again, recruit a uh, highly motivated student veterans here to USF Health, and then build a network that these veterans can work with and get connected to both professionally and, and academically, and then educate health profession students and faculty about these specific healthcare issues. And that was really our, bi our big mission so far. So divided up into three stages, we have a, a six-month stage, and then we have a, a up to one year, and then we have a, a post one year. Um, a lot of verbiage there, but basically we want to, in the first few months, we wanted to establish this network and create some media visibility on it. And we wanted to create some formal partnerships which we're in the process of doing now. And then lastly, we want to increase applications for next year to, uh, to the USF Health Colleges. And when we say USF Health Colleges, we're including the Morsani College of Medicine, the Masters in Medical Sciences program, the nursing program, the pharmacy school, physical therapy school, and the new physician assistant program that's beginning in 2015. We had an official launch um, beginning Veterans Day this year, and it, it covered about two weeks, and some of the different things that we, we did, um, Tom Fowler can, can talk on and talk about the media, but we had everything from local events that we did just on the undergrad campus, then we had different things here on the healthcare or on the health campus, and then we had some things downtown with the Buccaneers, and then um, also with uh, other, other military organizations. Yeah. So, yeah, this is uh, Tom here, the, the OSR representative for USF Health. Um, and so uh, just going back to that last thing, this is, you know, the strategic objectives this is something that, you know, any other school can use by all means. Um, and it's just the, the kind of when you do launch something, we think every school can really do this. Um, we are advantaged uh, in that we do have, you know, a very big VA hospital and a pretty big military presence here with McDill Air Force Base and everything. Um, but, you know, all medical schools do have veterans. Um, and so, the two-tier thing of supporting veterans that are coming back, um, they're great assets to medical schools. You know, they're disciplined and they're, you know, experienced. Um, they've seen a lot and they, you know, make very good medical students. Um, so just providing a good framework um, with the medical uh, students that, are, that already are in school and that are veterans, you know, so it's to kind of pair them up with people that are aspiring to go into healthcare professions. Um, and it's also, you know, they, they do serve when they are organized and there is kind of a, a specific entity um, that has identifiable, uh, you know, leaders um, within that group. Um, it does uh, serve a great purpose in that they can provide a resource to the rest of the medical uh, school community, you know, such as me, myself. You know, I'm not a veteran. I don't have any experience um, in that world. Um, but, you know, I can reach out now to the Veteran Health Success Network um, and ask them, hey, can we have a speaker? So we were, uh, you know, we had a great opportunity to have a lunch meeting uh, a couple of weeks back. We got a grant from the, the AAMC, and we're really grateful for that. So we had a, a couple hundred dollars to get some food for a lunch meeting, and then, you know, we reached out to the, the Tillman Military Scholars um, and the, the Veteran Success Network um, and asked, hey, do you guys have, you know, a, a young veteran that can come in and talk to the medical students and the nursing students and all the other, you know, public health students, whoever would like to come to hear more about um, just kind of a candid expression of uh, what young veterans need today um, and how they, you know, interact with healthcare providers and what they want to receive from them. Um, so it was great. You know, we got to, to have someone come in um, through this network and, the, and, and, you know, going through this phase one, I know media visibility uh, may seem a little, 
you know, not necessary, but um, it is very important to get uh, kind of the community involved and the community aware of such a resource, um, you know, because something that's merely good um, isn't terribly helpful if no one's aware of it. Um, so we, we did go through, um, you know, and these are some of the events that we did, you know, at the Alumni Center, we had a kickoff event. Um, we had an education luncheon. That's one that the AAMC sponsored. Um, you know, there's a health fair with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, so if you guys do have Tillman, scholar, Tillman military scholars at your medical school, um, there's something that you can work with them. You know, they have a very close relationship with the NFL, um, and working with the local NFL team um, is a great way to kind of get the word out. Um, and then, you know, there's also a team red, white, and blue. You know, over the veteran, Veterans Day weekend is kind of an opportune time to, to take advantage of of using the media and uh, using those resources to do that. And then, you know, all sorts of sports events and stuff during that week um, is when we kind of uh, put that out there. Because, you know, USF has a lot of undergrads that are veterans, um, and a lot of them that are interested in going into to medicine, you know, going into nursing, going into physical therapy, or going into uh, to medical school. And so, yeah, we're able to kind of have the, the media outreach to let people know that this resource is available. Um, and then, you know, undergrads can pair up with uh, medical students um, that are veterans as well, um, just so they feel a little bit, you know, that transition from uh, being in the field and being in the military career um, and then coming back uh, stateside and having to go through all your organic chemistry classes and your prerequisites and taking your MCAT, um, that can be a big barrier, you know, when you're, uh, you know, a non-traditional applicant um, and you don't have good uh, mentorship, and you don't have good advice. Um, that's that's a very big barrier, and this is just you know something that schools can do in order to um, to make that transition easier, um, and just to you know be a welcoming campus um, to people that feel a little ostracized sometimes because they feel different. And they feel that you know their experiences aren't relatable to a lot of the people maybe in admissions committee. Um, so yeah, we highly recommend doing stuff like this. And uh, in our presentation, we didn't we didn't put pictures, and you know, it, it's not as uh, fancy as it could have been, I suppose. But we're more than welcome to to get you know emails if you guys have questions or anything like that. We'd uh, be more than willing to help with that. Um, but Josiah is going to talk a little bit um, uh, more about uh, how you guys can go about doing that. One of the things that we did here just in the past week actually is one of the mandatory classes that every first and second year takes is called the doctoring course and it's basically teaching the students essentially how to talk to the different how to talk to different patients everything from interviews to hands-on to your clinical aspects doing your your physicals and all those sorts of things so this past week in working with joining forces initiative or as a part of joining forces initiative i should say we focused specifically on veterans and, and veterans with PTSD. So the common buzzword that, that most people think of when they think of veteran-specific healthcare issues is, is PTSD. But that is a small part of that because there are many other healthcare issues that are specific to veterans, um, not, not just PTSD, while PTSD is one of the major ones. And some of the other things that, that are specific to veterans is really just the, the concept of asking for help. Quite often in the civilian world, it's understood and it's somewhat expected that if you're having trouble or something doesn't feel right, then you talk to your friends, you talk to your doctor, and you go in and you get help. Well, that's actually the contrary in the military. Um, in the military, you often don't want to ask for help. You want to try to figure out on your own, and the last thing you want to do is, is ask for medical assistance, because if you get medical assistance, you're going to get pulled out of your unit. So that um, that is something that that many veterans initially struggle with when they leave the military is they don't want to seek help initially, whether it's for mental health or whether it's for physical health or whatever whatever the issue is. So that's some of the things that we addressed this past week to our entire class, and we had uh, standardized patients, basically actors, come in and, and discuss these issues and talk about how they could overcome them and really give the students an opportunity to role play being a provider and, and how to um, deal with, with patients, whether at the VA or in the civilian practice, just a patient who happens to be a veteran. So overall, and that was, that was our presentation, but again, just back to the, the success network that we want to do, um, the three tier, we want to recruit and network and educate both um, veterans and non-veterans alike, because there are many, many people who are passion, passionate about these issues and really everyone can stand to learn. So 
we would just like to thank ultimately all of our partners, um, USF Health, AAMC, the Got Your Six Foundation was a really big part of this, joining forces, Pat Tillman Foundation, also the AMA has, has helped quite a bit through all of this. So at this point, we'd like to pass it on to um, UCLA, and I'm looking for the name here on how to change it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so we're really proud to be here. Uh, I'm really glad to be with these fellow panelists. Uh, glad to hear their presenters here and hopefully podcasters in the future. Uh, so my name is Gil Weintraub, and I'm here with my fellow co-coordinator, Chris Roberts. We're currently third years at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and we're here to talk about a program that we're uh, exceptionally honored to represent. Uh, the Operation Men Medical Student Organization. Today we're going to be focusing on the Medical Student Buddy Program uh, that we founded last year. Uh, but to get a better idea of the Operation Men Student Organization, uh, we first want to introduce the Operation uh, Men Program itself. So, picture here is Marine Corporal Aaron Mankin. On May 11, 2005, he was wounded when the 26-ton amphibious assault vehicle he was traveling in rolled over an improvised explosive device and was propelled 10 feet in the air. Four Marines died in the attack and 11 others were injured. Corporal Mankin survived but suffered intense burns on over 25% of his body. His ears, nose, and mouth were essentially gone and he lost two fingers in his right hand. Corporal Mankin received over 48 surgeries uh, at Brook Army Medical Center in an attempt to, uh, as he often used to joke and put it, fix the pretty part. In fall 2006, uh, a philanthropist by the name of Ron Katz and his wife, Maddie, uh, heard about Corporal Mankin in a news story. Uh, they visited Brook Army Medical Center, and from that, uh, Operation Men, as we know it, was born. So Operation Men is a unique partnership between Brook Army Medical Center, the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System, and the UCLA Health System. Uh, and their mission and vision are very much in line with what's called the UCLA Greater Mission, to heal humankind one patient at a time by improving health, alleviating suffering, and delivering acts of kindness. So Operation Men seeks to heal the wounds of war through patient care, its research and education, using the best medicine, technology, and resources available uh, in both the public and private sector. Uh, so here we just have some of the statistics of the service men and women who have participated in Operation Men this far. Uh, and in, at first blush, 93 patients may not seem like a lot, but it's important to remember that each patient may receive multiple procedures, some of them upwards of 30. Uh, and many are seen for pre-op, post-op, as well as rehabilitation. So you, you may notice that the Army and the Marine Corps are the best represented in the program, uh, and that's largely due to their roles in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but we're proud to have veterans hailing from the Navy, Air Force, and National Guard as well. Uh, and this follow-up slide just to simply meant to reinforce the scale of the commitment being made to every member of the program. Always new appointments and always new procedures being made. Uh, and the goal is not to replace the treatments that the veterans are receiving at home but rather helping them while they're here at UCLA and you know, forwarding the goal of continuing with care when they return home. So listed here in the fine print, uh, you can see some of the clinical services provided ranging from anything from reconstructive plastic surgery to uh, addiction intervention, uh, all with the expressed effort of healing wounds of war. Uh, we think that one of the best ways to really get an idea of the incredible work done in Operation MEND is to see some of the veterans who have participated in the program. So we'll highlight just a few of the services offered by Operation Men, uh, starting with uh, facial reconstruction. So pictured here, you see Army Specialist Joey Polk. He was injured in Afghanistan on July 5, 2007, when his tactical vehicle was hit by three anti-tank mines, uh, flipping over his vehicle, igniting the fuel tank. Joey suffered burns to 40% of his body and face, had smoke inhalation, paralysis of his vocal cords, and complete amputation of all ten fingers. He had to relearn how to walk, how to talk, how to swallow, and cope with the use of, without, with the use of his hands. 
uh, after numerous surgeries, not only has he been able to regain his function, but he's reclaimed his personality. Uh, one of the most remarkable aspects of Operation Mend is seeing an emotional transformation that accompanies the physical transformation. Uh, sadly, Joey's loss of his fingers is not unique. Uh, many of the wounded servicemen and women uh, have severe injuries to their extremities. So in an effort to help them regain dexterity, function, and sense of normalcy, Operation Mend has been a leader in both hand reconstruction as well as hand transplant. But it's important that Operation Men doesn't really only seek to heal the veteran's physical wounds, but to also heal the person beneath the injuries. And one of the ways Operation Men seeks to do this is with the Buddy Program. So the Buddy Program was developed to support and care for servicemen and women who come to UCLA for treatment. For most, they travel across the country and receive these surgeries. Los Angeles is not their home, uh, and it can be a daunting place to stay. Uh, furthermore, uh, the types of injuries seen are often accompanied with PTSD or, or TBIs, or traumatic brain injuries. Uh, and, and this is where we finally make it to where the Operation Men Medical Student Organization fits in. So of the variety of activities we participate in on campus, uh, one of the most important, we think, is the Medical Student Buddy Family Program. The role of the Buddy Family is to be present for the patient. Each patient has their own unique family, which is often an actual family who lives in Los Angeles. Uh, it turns out that many of the wounded men or women are in their early 20s. Uh, and through our own experiences, we found that some of them were more comfortable with the idea of being surrounded by kind of younger people, people more their age, uh, rather than the more traditional established families. So a medical student buddy family is typically made up of four students who function as a longitudinal support structure for veterans. So you remember, you see that the veterans came back for multiple visits, and, and we, our goal is to see them at all of them. Uh, our role is to fill that particular servicemen, men or women's uh, individual needs. So whether that means taking shopping at Santa Monica Third Street Promenade, meeting for lunch or dinner at a beloved In-N-Out, uh, or going to the beach, just taking the view, or catching up over a cup of coffee. Uh, pictured here are some of the facilities at the Ronald Reagan Hospital at UCLA. Uh, and part of the Medical Student Buddy Program allows students to have the opportunity to accompany their buddy to their clinic appointments, to shadow their operations, and visit them during recovery. So it is definitely a time-intensive commitment, but it's also a very incredibly rewarding one as well. So these hours spent largely outside the healthcare setting have really allowed us to grow and bond with these incredible people. We thought a lot about what makes the experience so impactful, not only for the patient, but for us as future doctors. And we believe it's the human connection. There's been a lot of interest about how different aspects of medical school curriculum can erode empathy in medical students, uh, particularly in the third year. And subsequently, there's been large efforts to find ways to intervene, to help maintain and nurture the spirit that drew us all initially into medicine in the very beginning. And, you know, we think that it's programs like this that may provide a valuable method to maintain humanism in medicine. And we also believe similar programs can be integrated across, uh, across other schools. So whether that means establishing programs like this or designing something similar with a population of patients that have a, a significant longitudinal need for support. A uh, quick example might be transplant patients. But regardless, many medical schools have local VAs, and I think they represent really fertile ground to reach out and start projects like this. So in the time we spend with these amazing people, for once in medical school, it's not, we're not there to focus on the mastery of knowledge, we're not there to generate wide differentials, and we're not searching through random memory stores to figure out if it's, you know, like a ulcerative colitis or Crohn's that's associated with primary bilicerosis. So you know, whether you're at dinner or you're at the bedside, uh, our job as a buddy family is to simply be. And it's in these moments, you know, all the intellectualization and pretenses, everything just kind of drops away. Uh, it's you and it's them. And we've learned that if you get to know someone as a person before you know them as a patient, the first thing you always see when you're caring for them is the person. And it's truly humbling to be a part of someone's life who sacrificed so much for our freedoms. 
So to see their transformation both physically and mentally, uh, it's, it's really been inspiring. We believe programs such as Operation Men Medical Student Study Program may be valuable not teaching us what it means to be doctors, but for reminding us uh, really what it means to be human. So uh, we kind of want to bring it full, full circle and end with this sequence of Marine Corporal Aaron Mankin. So Tassi really serves as a reminder not only of the amazing physical transformation that the service men and women undergo as part of Operation Men. So here you see him pictured with the founder, uh, Mr. Katz. But, you know, also he's a testament to the incredible uh, reawakening of kind of the personality and who they are. Uh, so again, we'd like to thank everybody uh, for listening. Uh, we'd like to thank the incredible doctors and staff and volunteers at Operation Men for the important work they do. You know, we're incredibly honored to represent them here today. Uh, we want to thank you for taking time to learn about Operation Men, the Operation Men Medical Student Organization, and the Buddy Program. And we really hope, you know, it'll help, in, help you in your endeavors increase veteran awareness and education on your campus. So with that, I will turn the mic back over to Ronnie, if I'm technically savvy enough. Okay. Thank you very much. Before I open the floor up for questions, I'd like to say a few thank yous. First of all, to the panelists for their tremendous work, which, is, which has made a tremendous impact in the veterans' lives and the communities that they're involved with. I'd also like to thank Anita Navarro, Ali Anderson, Dr. Jeff Young, and Dr. Prescott for their mentorship and their help in promoting this initiative amongst the OSR. And, for, and lastly, and most importantly, I'd like to thank the veterans for their support, their service, and for allowing them to be such an impactful part of our education and development. The first question, which comes from an attendee, is, did they ever experience any resistance from students or faculty at their institutions as they set up these programs? Were they greeted with any hostility or indifference? If so, how did you handle it? And for the panelists, feel free to chime in. So this is Chris Roberts. I'm with uh, the UCLA School of Medicine. And, um, with Operation Men, so when we came into the picture, there was a, an existing buddy family program, but it was very uh, kind of protected and limited to the family structures. And so I wouldn't say that we experienced resistance per se, but it did take us uh, quite a while to establish trust, um, primarily because of the sensitivity of, of many of the, of the patients who come in who may have TBI or PTSD, and it's, I mean, Basically, Operation Men takes full responsibility for their wellness once they land in L.A. So the idea of sending a patient out with, you know, some young medical students, I think, was a little bit, um, they were a little apprehensive at first just because of the complexity of some of the, some of the psychological um, trauma that they've experienced and the potential for a problem if you're out in the crowd. Um, so basically, we kind of just... Um, we, we did a lot of other things besides the buddy family programs, and once trust was established with, with the people involved in the, the parent organization, it wasn't very difficult to do um, basically a trial run with some of the more senior people in the medical student uh, program. So it took a little bit of patience, but um, overall they were fairly receptive. Hi, this is Amy. I, I'll just make a few comments on that. It's a great question. Um, so in, in focusing on the narrative medicine course, I think among students, it takes a bit to catch on with students. Um, they sometimes feel that the culture on rounds, you really just focus on the chief complaints or presenting problems and less on um, emotional health and really the background of the patient. So I think in, in initially starting this course with my classmates, some people just thought it's too soft. They were kind of uncomfortable doing it, not really sure um, how to start. But where it, I think instead of kind of defending the course or pointing out the good things, I think the, the best was to lead by example. So they started to notice that on rounds, people who did narrative really understood their patients. They really um, knew them better than anybody else in the team, and they could. Relay the, relay the, um, 
desires of the patient better than anybody else on round. So I think it started catching on once you once we started an example of this is something that helps you understand your patient, helps you get to know them, and it really improved outcomes with our patients. Uh, this is Eric from Penn State. I uh, just wanted to also add a couple comments. Um, at our institution, we actually did not run into uh, any kind of uh, resistance. Um, certainly the struggle was to try and identify those physicians um, who had prior military service because there was no central database of that nature. Now, when trying to invite students to attend the talks, uh, there, there there was a bit more struggle. Um, certainly the students who are on HPSB scholarships um, have more of a vested interest in attending the talks. Um, the one point I would make about that would be because we focused our event on Veterans Day, um, that allowed us to attract a, a wider diversity of students. But if we were to try and align that event with um, on a separate day that really didn't, didn't align with uh, Veterans Day, I think we would have had a bit more of a challenge to have students attend. And I'll just add to that, anecdotally, I've, I've been just extremely humbled by the support that I've received, not only at the AAMC, but during my time as a medical student at the Medical College of Georgia, the administration there, in implementing these projects. I, I think it's, uh, it's evident that there is a significant amount of added value to our development as physicians in being well-versed in the specific issues that, that our veterans and their families face. And I will say, after six months of, uh, of serving as an intern here at the University of Pennsylvania, I am extremely grateful for that, for those uh, opportunities to learn and grow. And I, I hope that my patients uh, have benefited from that education. And I'd like to encourage any of the attendees that, to feel free to, to ask any questions that you may have. One, one question I have for the panelists is uh, what they took away as the most influential uh, part of their experience. Hello, this is Josiah Hill, again, from USF, Morristown College of Medicine. And I'd just like to take that. As a veteran myself, I was extremely humbled by the amount of support that we got, not only from our faculty administration, but from the staff and really from the students, actually. It was, it was incredible to see uh, the amount of support and interest, true interest, that, that came, not just from medical students because they felt like they had to be there, but rather from nursing students and physical therapy and just all health professions so the entire spectrum was really very humbling to see that people actually wanted to understand how to do this and <clears throat> how to interact with veterans uh, and how to give them better health care and, and what they could do, do to help. So it was, it was quite an amazing experience and a great, great project that we look forward to taking even further in the future. Yeah, and that's why we thought that, this is Tom from USF, um, we, we thought kind of the reaching out part at the beginning before you launch the project um, it's pretty important since there are, and you know whether you think so or not. I mean, you know, there are people that have family members and that have, you know, relatives or they have some kind of you know personal connection why they would want to get involved into something like that. Um, so some of it really is just kind of framing how your project is going to help veterans and how your project is going to, you know, impact um, that community. And I think that's yeah, that's an important stage that's sometimes neglected at the very beginning, um, but to set that foundation, uh, I think garnered a lot of support um, from people once they understood what we were doing and that we were actually doing anything in the first place. You know, getting the word out um, was a pretty big, big step that led to a lot of success, you know, just to find the, find the supporters. Um, so, yeah. This is Catherine Cartien from the VA in D.C. as well as GW. I'm about the narrative medicine curriculum. I'd say what I've taken away from that and having students do this there's been over 200 students who have come through and written stories. It's just the power 
profound power of those stories and narratives to help us understand veterans and just patients and people in general and how many students, because they write the story down, they become co-authors of that narrative with their veteran patients. And they feel like they're on the same team then. Um, and it's been quite humbling about the response from both students and patients. There are some patients that have cried at the reading back of their narrative, and some have asked to keep a copy of the story to keep in their Bible or their safe at home. They want to show all their friends and family this narrative that a student has written about them. So it's been very humbling, extremely profound, and a really easy and simple activity to do. This is Amy. Um, just want to point out two things for what's been the most influential part of the experience for me. First, being at a, on a personal level, so doing a narrative with a patient really helped me work through my own emotions. There were a number of times where I went in, the patient was either frustrated or they were just really depressed, they were really angry, and afterwards I left and I felt a little discombobulated and I didn't actually know how to work through my own emotions. So sitting down and writing the narrative, after getting one or two paragraphs out, I really felt a lot more settled in my approach and the way that I felt about how the situation went, and I could put my thoughts together and go back and talk to the patient. And then the second, it's really just treating patients like humans. I think so many times we go in and we, we have a list of questions we have to ask in the morning, how you're feeling, how you know how you how you did overnight, and then go over the plan. And so often we're really just talking about you know, symptoms and plans that we we really lose the patient and and the person that we're talking to. So spending time with patients, I think, was the most significant to me in in really connecting with my patients. And I've seen this with a number of patients where, after talking with them, I realize we've given them so many options of what we can do for them, that it just becomes really confusing when all they want to do is go home. Um, so it really helps you refocus um, and keep the patient at the center of your care. And this is Eric from Penn State. I just want to add two more comments. Uh, as far as the event was concerned, um, I, was very, I was floored by the generosity at the time and willingness to help by the speakers and everyone else involved. Specifically, um, I was surprised by how, how the wealth of resources that were available in-house and externally. And personally, uh, it was influential in the sense that I re realized that I actually did not uh, frequently ask about military history uh, or military service in, in clinic. So I now make a habit of asking that question to each of the patients that I meet with during clinical skills. And just having that one question be the focus for, for our institution, at least, to encourage students to ask that one question about military service was very influential for us. Are there any more questions from any of the attendees? Well, if there are no questions at that at this time, I'd like to again thank you, thank the panelists for uh, for being here today and sharing some of the fantastic work that you guys have done. And I'd like to turn uh, turn the microphone back over to Marcy Sutherland. Thank you, Ronnie, and thank you for being our moderator today. And again, thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, this showcase has been a wonderful display of the work that is going on at medical schools across the nation and their dedication to our veterans, service members, and their families. Thank you to our participants for, uh, participants for attending today. We encourage you to complete the survey that follows this webinar to provide feedback. This concludes today's showcase webinar. Thank you.